Hello everyone and we are back in the Wisdom Factory with the uh, edition in English and today I'm really excited because I have a person from India to talk about it is Abhishek Takore and we met at the Integral Conference, the online conference which was in May 2021, so this year, a few weeks ago and uh, I was curious how the situation is in India and you know, in all respects, uh, the life in India, because I have never been in India. So I'm really, 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 really excited to learn a little bit about that. But before we go into question, into the conversation, could you please uh, tell us a little bit about you, about your life, what you are doing, where you are, I mean, in India, but all the circumstances. And also the second thing, how come that you were at the Integral Conference? How come that you were interested? <laughs> So over to you. Okay, namaste, Heidi. Thank you, firstly. Thank you so much for having me over. It's always a joy to have conversations with my family. I feel like we are one family who meets each other. And when we meet, we are already resonating. Like it doesn't need something different. So I feel when I meet you, I already feel familiar to you in a, in a way, you know, and it's so nice to uh, be in conversation. Um, I am a product of India. <laughs> I'm born in Mumbai, uh, which is India's largest city in suburban Mumbai from a middle class family. And uh, now I continue to live in Mumbai with my family. I have a 14 year old daughter. <clears throat> my partner is a theater actor and I am a social worker. So my work is primarily in the not for profit space in India, building leadership in young people, building communities, and uh, really trying to birth the future, right? I think all of us are trying to create a future that works for us as well as the coming generations. And my quest is not very different. Uh, and I will share a bit more about myself as we go along. Uh, but want to come to your question of how are things in India? Uh, and uh, it is... Uh, it let's, is always, start, let's start yeah. with everyday life and uh, then maybe also with the strange uh, illness we have, but I don't want to focus on that, but then yeah. how, how society is moving, how it is, uh, you know, it was, yeah. I heard a lot of things about India, how it was before, so where it is going. And <laughs> wow, so to, to answer about India always, one will be wrong because there is no one India, just as there is no one Europe or one world, right? And India has a population greater than uh, Europe. So you can imagine the number of people. And if I can use the integral language a little bit, uh, of course, there's an Indian way of looking at this, but I'm using integral because maybe that is more familiar with listeners. Uh, so I feel that in India, all these levels coexist the red and the blue or amber and the orange and the green. Uh, I feel the designers of the culture were second tier people who have designed a culture that can accommodate all this diversity. So the daily life for me is very different from the daily life of a typical uh, Indian in a city is different from an Indian in rural India. So I will talk a little bit about myself and then how it is different, right? So yeah. I am... Yeah, I am at a very fortunate confluence of being a part of India and the global family. Um, and uh, uh, we are from cosmopolitan India. We have exposure to the world. Uh, and the best example I can give is our breakfast, right? Like my breakfast can be a South Indian snack like idli. It can be poha, which is a West Indian snack. Sometimes it can be a paratha, which is North Indian. But it can also be... Uh, uh, waffles and pancakes and omelets and uh, everything that you're familiar with as well. So it's almost like it's a confluence for me of the some of the international uh, experiences and some local. Um, even in terms of yeah, this sorry. the heritage of 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 the British Empire. Yes, <laughs> also <laughs> some of it, so. and and some of it is also just that we are a global culture. Like uh, a part of India's culture is also very global. Like there are some conversations I'm able to have with you uh, 
which I will be able to have with a very few people in India at the moment because they are not exposed to some of uh, these ideas around integral and so on. So I feel like I belong to India and I belong to a global family. So for me, every day is different. But these days, the work is a lot around COVID, around helping uh, relief efforts related to COVID. And I work with NGOs. So I work with my own not-for-profit, Blue Ribbon Movement. I support other organizations also. Uh, so every day is different in a way. And I like it that way. Uh, but it is filled with exciting conversations. It is filled with some concrete action. Um, and I think the life of the average Indian citizen has been affected badly by the pandemic. Uh, people are migrating, they're losing jobs, the economy is shrinking, the middle class has shrunk, people have moved to poverty. So it is a difficult time for us. It is definitely a difficult time uh, in India just as it's in the world, I guess, but in some ways a little, uh, I think India got very overconfident very soon after the first wave, we felt we have done really well. We started exporting vaccines and then the second wave took us by a surprise and that was tough. Yeah, I heard at the beginning that many people starved because they were sent away and then they tried to reach their homes far away and uh, that's why they died and not so much about the, the illness. And at the moment uh, in Europe, the fear is uh, heightened by saying, oh, India, people are dying and dying and dying because we have a fear pandemic more than a real pandemic, in my opinion. But how is it? Is it really that it is everywhere on the streets, people lying dead? No, no. Of... <laughs> but they try no, to make no. us believe that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. There are, of course, some images which are very, uh, they can shake you. It is definitely not that people are dying everywhere. Also, the moment you put our population in perspective, as a percentage, you will see that percentage is not as much, right? It's just that there are too many people. So when there are too many people as a percentage, you will have a lot of people who are no longer there. Uh, but in a city like Mumbai, for example, we are quite, uh, our, our rates have really fallen in terms of the rates of infection and deaths. Over the last 15 days also, things have radically improved in India. So uh, so there was a period where it was very bad in some regions. Uh, the media took that and kind of amplified it and made a poster out of it, I would say. So uh, so yeah, it's it's tough, but it's not that people are dying on the streets. Yeah, that's that's good because I'm a little bit, um, how do you say, disappointed that it is so much fear mongering around and so less real thinking about it, as you said, putting in context the, the numbers, you know, and things like that. That doesn't happen. And people believe all this stuff. And I'm getting a little angry on this, but it's not the topic of today. <laughs> I want to know. Sure. <laughs> to sure. know uh, yeah, you said. Uh, the in, let's say the integral people of the conference are your people. Uh, how come? <laughs> how come? How did you meet them? You say you you don't find people around your in your country near you, as I don't in Italy, uh, by the way. But uh, how come that you found the way to integral community? So I have been familiar with Ken Wilber's work for a while now, maybe a decade or so. I came across his work because I was trying to engage in social change and uh, some of the integral theories ideas are helpful for doing uh, social change work. And this was the time when integral was much more active in North America. So I was in touch there. And then I feel over the last few years, the, uh, the center point has shifted to Europe in some ways over uh, because of the IEC and all. And I was actually going to attend the Integral European Conference uh, a couple of years ago, but financially and planetarily both, it was a stretch. Uh, but I had a lot of one-on-one -on -one friends in the Integral community also. Um, so there is an Indian ethos also, an uh, Indian worldview of how we look at the world. And I see myself as a bridge between our ways of looking and the integral way of looking at the world. And I feel it's Let important. Let us talk about that. Let <laughs> us talk about that because I'm really in doubt if our Western world view is 
it's worthwhile to be put over all the other people in the world, you know, so let's say yeah, it this yeah. way. I would like to explore what uh, other cultures uh, have to bring to the table and which should be listened to. So I, I would like you to tell me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to tell. So I think the first thing to look at in terms of the Indian culture is that it is a culture born in abundance. And it is not that we did anything to do that, but just that the Indian peninsula had very life-supporting conditions. Uh, it had crisscrossing rivers, it had a temperature that was also adequate, and a decent diversity of flora and fauna. So you can see an uninterrupted civilization for the last 2000 years, which also made very early progress. Uh, and I feel when there is enough, uh, the culture does not spend too much time fighting as much as about contemplating on deeper questions of life. And I feel like people like Buddha and Mahavir and before that the Vedanta and those traditions. So, <clears throat> so the quest has been to understand the inner world and life. And there's a very rich body of knowledge, uh, multiple bodies of knowledge that have come there. And I think the, the primary, there are a few primary kind of pillar stones and one of them is what I would call polytheistic thinking, where uh, multiple ways of thinking and looking at the world are allowed to coexist and they are in dialogue with each other. So I think the, the need for a totalitarian philosophy, overriding philosophy, uh, does not innately belong to India. Like it's not our need that we create a model which covers everything. Like it's okay. And in fact, if there is a model that claims to cover everything, we almost, we don't laugh at the attempt, but we feel, I feel very tender about such an attempt. Like it's a, it's a sweet attempt, but it's such a limited attempt. Like any attempt to make a totalitarian or even have the conviction to believe that you could actually create something overriding and totalitarian to me is not, an, it's never been an Indian quest. The Indian quest has been dialogue. It's been constant dialogue with truths rather than to create an overriding truth. So you should take the, the, the lead now because with our totalitarian tendencies, cultural, but also political, we have destroyed the world and we have come out completely out of abundance. They have instilled this scarcity artificially and have created the world scarce now because they have destroyed so much. Our way of thinking is, I was not aware about that for a long time, no? but now I'm getting really completely aware that we have not only colonized physically the countries and brought our good practices into these countries, but we have colonized the minds. Yes. And we have colonized the land, you know, by exploiting and by ruining. So I was curious, you, you said India was very, uh, how do you say, um, abundant. abundant and everything. And we hear, hear about um, dryness and everything. So even the country has changed by our colonization. The, 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 the way I have also heard that Bayer or Monsanto, one of these um, uh, big companies, they force Indian farmers to buy the seeds because they are not allowed anymore to use their own seeds like it was. I mean, do, can you imagine something worse than that? It's, it's, for me, it's it's mind blowing, you know. Yeah, it's terrible. What is happening yeah. on the world now? It's not a, a, a little illness, but it's really a, a mind which has gone crazy. And yeah. It's, yes. It's, it's it's leading all the others into craziness. I mean, all the yes. and people agree to become crazy and and believe all this. Oh dear, I don't want I don't want to go into that. But I think we have. We, Western world, beginning mm. with Europe and then America, which is more the leading force now, I think we have really ruined the life on Earth. Mm. And it's now the time that we have to stand up and say, no, we want to live differently in abundance. 
and in connection mm. with nature and with spirituality, real spirituality, the mm. research mm. for who am I, as you say, no? And, um, and not to have to buy, have to buy, buy. Yeah, yeah. This one and this and this and oh. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, on, if, and sometimes I go into my rants, you know, <laughs> forgive me, but tell me more about that. I think uh, we are doing our own reflection in India very actively because we are as much a part of this global mindset that may not innately belong to India, but now we are also acting like that, right? The minds are colonized, the behavior is that way. And what we have found seems to be a few type of Indian minds. There is the victim Indian mind, which feels like we are victims of colonization and so feels all horrible about themselves. And we are like, that is not the way. There is a very proud Indian mind that feels very, almost like the right wing kind. We are the best culture kind. We're like, that is also not us. There is also a very reformist Indian mind that is in envy of the West and wants to shape India in the image of the West. And we're like, that is also not us. So these three are not our minds. So we are trying to reclaim a very authentic Indian cultural mind that is beyond these three. It is a confident mind that is located in its truth, but is also humble and is willing to dialogue and not claim to be the best, just claim to be willing to non-violently dialogue. Right? And non-violence is a big part of that part of our culture and Gandhi represents that. So non-violently dialoguing, coexisting and, and just uh, I think the wisdom traditions in India have a lot to offer. For example, in Jainism, there is something called a parigraha where you do not consume more than what you need. Like you set active boundaries on your consumption and actively reduce it. That is not scarcity. It is actually frugality coming from a space of abundance. It's for your own purification. So there are some very beautiful practices that we have that we want to revive uh, from our wisdom traditions while also honoring the scientific achievements that the West has brought us. So it is not a complete disregard of saying, oh God, this, it's not a complete rejection. In a way, it is integral. The intent is to dialogue and discover what is appropriate for us but it is small scale. It is very local. That's kind of the nature of the attempt. So yeah, that's what we've been on to. Yeah, we're wish... also one more thing I want to say is also we are very in touch with our cultural shadows. I mean, I would not say we are in touch with our shadows, but I would say in the work I'm trying to do, we're also digging deep into what is the shadow of our culture? What have we not confronted? We've not confronted our shame, our guilt, our grief. And all that manifests in unhealthy ways in India, right? So we are also saying, can we do some of that? We're doing some colonial healing dialogues also with people from the United Kingdom and trying to see if we can talk about, you know, what's our relationship with the past. And yeah, so multiple things. That's that's wonderful um, because uh, shadow is everywhere and needs to be to be worked on because otherwise it happens what is happening now in Germany. I don't know how far you are uh, informed. Uh, we haven't worked enough on the shadow. And so, you know, people behave a little bit like 80, 90 years ago. Uh, and that's disconcerting. How do you say it? Discon disheartening yes. for me. Mm. Yeah. So uh, what I like, and which is not the practice now, at least in the Western world, what you say is the basis of your culture is the dialogue talking to each other at the moment in the western world especially with this strange uh, so-called so pandemic it is or you are one side and believe this or you are uh, even dangerous or something mm -hmm. if you only try to bring in reason so for me we have degraded into into blue uh, uh, i've used spiral dynamics mm -hmm. normally mm -hmm. as the as the colors we have degraded from orange and even um, mm -hmm. and even mm -hmm. green into blue into belief systems and the people who are in orange and try to bring their expertise into the into the into the mix they are censored they are taken off the the public awareness and you know no the the 
press is not talking about them. They are denigrating them. They are, you know, uh, fighting against somebody who has another approach, which is not mm -hmm. a belief necessarily, because there are many scientific findings which are different. And science should, in Orange, they should work by dialogue. They should yeah. talk. And these people who have different findings, they ask the, they ask the scientists who are on the basis of all these decisions to come and talk with them and tell them on what their decisions are based, but they don't come. They don't come into dialogue. So this is for me the end of end of any culture in based on orange, let's say. Then it's only scientism for me. It's not yeah, science yeah. anymore. That's and, so important. That's a very important point you're making. Yeah, and, and it's, it's and so, not science, it's scientism. That's scientism. And how can we get out of it? And how can we go back into abundance with all these threats of uh, economic financial system, which will break and whatever, you know, how can we from grassroots up recreate something which is representing life? I imagine that in India, it's more easy because you are not yet many people are not yet as crazy as as we are here everywhere as you say you are more self-constricting which by the way is my way of being i was born a few years after the the war and we still had uh, not so much to eat at home and so for me it's natural to to save things not to throw everything away and so but i see how the whole culture here is buy something throw it away but and the plastics and all this stuff so I imagine that in your country, it would be easier to, to create new abundant communities and from bring the culture back into a reasonable yeah. way of being. <laughs> yes, I hear that from a lot of my global family friends that India has a very fertile soil for experiments. And it has been a fertile soil so and a resilient soil. So it doesn't break easily. It'll just absorb things and so on. So it's a different, it seems that, yeah, it might uh, have our own work to do. Uh, but what has happened is I feel that we are a very trusting people, very trusting, innately trusting people. You know, we have... Uh, trusting in what? In, in Trusting life? in the other, trusting in the other, trusting in life, because we are interconnected. So we trust. And sometimes that trust is unhealthy. Because uh, I think what you said, I want to go back to that science and scientism. Uh, the scientific method is a beautiful thing. And I would say, in fact, Gandhiji is a proponent of the scientific method applied to a person. He applied the scientific method to himself to discover truths. Uh, Buddha also applied that method to discover truths, empirically seeing what's happening. But science as a religion... Uh, misuse of science unethically, like Monsanto and Bayer come and they weaponize science. And India is at the receiving end of a lot of weaponized science, uh, which is not healthy. And we haven't fully resisted that because there is still some awe of the West, there is still some fascination, there is still some wanting to copy uh, in, in people and even in our leaders. Now from the West, it's moved to China, but there is still like, we want to copy, we don't want to be ourselves. It's almost like our confidence is crushed. And I think uh, connecting to what you were saying, I think reclaiming that for us, our own innate confidence to say, okay, we are who we are and it's enough. We don't need to be someone else or anything else. Uh, and in being that, we'll do a contribution. Our contribution to the world will be made. I think that's... Absolutely, because I think it's uh, in the Western world is almost hopeless that we can. I mean, we will try it too. We will try to create little hubs, you know, of an, a different life. I will do that here in my country house and so on. But it is too far away from how life has developed in, in our part of the world. While you could probably more easily recreate it and then be an example for us, you know, because yeah. we are people who are like me, you know, we are looking for, I don't want to say help, but inspiration. How, how can we do that? How can we come back to connection with nature instead of <laughs> trying even to make uh, humans artificial, you know, by, by gene uh, change or whatever, or mm -hmm. by 
what they all what they all plan to do chip and everything maybe probably hopefully they haven't done it yet but only the idea to better humans by technology you know that that must be what the ill mind must that be yeah. in my opinion you know yeah, yeah. and <clears throat> i think we who are thinking differently are relatively few in in our country countries yeah. or maybe some are sympathizing with this idea but they don't come out they don't take the consequences and i really would hope that we get some inspiration by a country which is showing us how to do that there are actually hundreds of stories of beautiful alternatives in india and they have also been documented yet what the media chooses to highlight are always the wrong things they'll not highlight the alternatives and the beautiful stories people have worked their entire lifetimes to create things and uh, yeah it, it, there are so many alternatives around this country of people doing different things so yeah, yeah. so the the media control is the same yeah i mean we are a global world now governed by global forces but anyway yeah. uh, if you have examples, maybe films or documents or something, you can send them to me, the, the address, uh, uh, and then I will link this to the... I will send you a yeah, we, website. We yeah. are in a period where we need inspiration, otherwise people like me would despair. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. So, tell me more. Uh, why don't you tell me a bit about you and what questions you are holding? It would be nice to hear what questions. Yeah, my are. question is how can we come back in, in, into in mental and physical yeah. sanity? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, how can we come back to, to uh, alignment with nature? Yeah. How yeah. can we come back to, uh, I don't want even to say back, I want to say come to, towards. <laughs> Uh, yeah because yeah, yeah. it was not everything good in the past you know yeah some yeah, things yeah. were good yeah. how can we do for instance agriculture differently yeah i mean yeah. i have here very stony ground but i still have a vegetable garden and i have olive trees and Lovely. how can we be able to create local uh, com communities in the sense of self-sufficient why do we need to tomatoes from china when we have tomatoes in summer here in italy so all these things you know uh, mm -hmm. these are my uh, my concerns and how do we this is on the outside and on the on the left hand quadrants how can we create community which is resilient that means shadow work growing up together so that both quadrants on the left no that we uh, are able really to do shadow work, really to look into the things which are ours and then which are of the group and how can we live and be together, uh, conflict, able to, to, to resolve conflict, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I know I, I have a long journey behind me and I was not always able, and even now it's not easy. So to discover how to live together in peace, I think. This is, at the end, my main concern, you know? yeah, yeah, and yeah. it starts in the couple, you know, I did when my husband was still alive, it, we started to do a course of, you know, uh, of couples being in a couple, um, because my idea is if we cannot make peace in the couple and in the family, how can we have peace in the world? Because who is ruling yes, and yes, is doing decisions yes. in the world, there are people. And if they haven't learned to, to come together and uh, resolve conflicts in their own lives, how can you think that they can do it with the country? Yeah, that's so important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's me. <laughs> now, I would be interested I, to know also what you are, you can say something on naturally, so what I, on what I said, but what ex exactly you are doing, what is your, your, your everyday work in, in, yeah, in yeah. yeah, that would be as a social as, worker. Yeah, um, I'll share to what I am learning uh, as well. And then maybe from there, I can come into what I'm doing as a social worker. Uh, I think when I'm learning that words and maps have a very limited place and we should put them back into their place. I feel we are colonized by words, concepts and maps and they start running us. And instead, if we can 
energetically sense resonances, uh, intuitively pay attention to coincidences and see energy fields. I think then nature starts organizing rather than our minds. And I think nature is an intelligence that we have to increasingly lean into and trust. Like saying, okay, if this is coming up, this is, let me honor what's showing up. I think something definitely there and related to that, just investing in the process without guaranteed outcomes because we get so obsessed with outcomes. So just flowing with the process, I think resonance seems to be one. And the energy of metta, like unconditional love, like Buddhist idea of metta is like loving kindness. It's almost like I wish you well. My soul wishes your soul well. And I think that metta travels. It travels, it, it gets picked. You can't say it in words, but there's a it's it's embodied. It pick it, we pick it up. You know, so we can't fake the, the thing with the mind is it tends to keep building on itself and we start showing off all the concepts and ideas and everything we know without it getting embodied. And I sometimes feel the very concepts become a barrier to deep embodiment. Uh, you know, and... that's in our education, it has been like this. The mind had been the absolute priority and your feelings didn't count. Your perceptions yeah, didn't yeah, count. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. even uh, you were educated to not trust your perceptions. So it is a hard work to come back to that. And I noticed yes, it really, yes. really a lot. And what you are saying, it reminds me, uh, I was at the integral conference in South Africa and mm -hmm. they were talking about Ubuntu. Mm, yes, that, yes. And then yes. I, I listened also to Bayo Akumolaf. Yes. You know, you yes. know him. He yeah, yeah, of India. course. Yeah. And uh, these are all concepts which are fascinating to me. But in our normal, normal world, they seem like, you know, they are dismissed as childish or something, you yeah, know. Yeah. So how can we come back, not come back? I don't want to say come back, come forth <laughs> to this way of seeing the world. It must not be, it should not be the only way of seeing the world. That's for sure. But what we are doing now, the only way of seeing the world in this other way, that's for sure counterproductive, destructive in my way. We are seeing the destruction already all over the, yeah. the world, yeah. you know. So how can we... <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, better we, we should we should include we should ask you all people from these other cultures to come in and do yeah. big workshops, big to conferences, and get our people who have no idea, mainly a few green people, maybe, but the rest not. Give them the inspiration and the attractiveness of living in a different way of seeing life in a different way. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's a dialogue which definitely needs to happen. Hope so. And I'm so glad that you are in <laughs> our community and yes, hopefully so more yeah. people of, of these yes, other definitely. countries are coming. Really I, I hear now more than before I hear an invitation, I hear a willingness to be received. It has definitely changed over the years. Uh, I think it's at its peak, I would say right now, compared to I have ever seen, like I've been a bystander to these places. And I think now there is a, an opening, there is an invitation and I feel it. I feel it in so many ways. So there is a lot of gratitude for that. Oh, good. Because we need the wisdom. We need, yeah, the, yeah. we don't need much more knowledge. We need much more wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Let me share what I do. Uh, so I work at multiple levels simultaneously because that's the gift I feel I have. And I try to be present there. Uh, so locally in Mumbai is an organization called Blue Ribbon Movement. I'm the founder of that organization. We build leadership in young people through community work. So we get young people into service learning projects and then they become leaders. Um, and we work with the alumni then, people who go through this program. And the alumni works with this idea of 100% consent. So decision-making with 100% consent and really experimenting with that at a very radical level. So that's been the exciting thing at the local level that we are doing. Um, 
at the national level i'm a part of several networks uh, of organizations and i call it the ecosystem space i say that this is not a space which is the corporate the government or the ngo space it is the space between these spaces so i am trying to work in the ecosystem space trying to link up and trying to birth a collective future because there are too many silos so at the national level i'm plugged into several networks and now the covid work we are doing is also happening nationally uh, helping with fundraising holding circles of people who are providing support so a lot of work is national uh, south asian level work is something called south asian youth conference so that's between countries of south asia pakistan afghanistan india maldives bhutan nepal uh, bangladesh sri lanka and us as a subcontinent trying to do work with young people there so that was a something i started in 2011 and uh, it continues so it's 10 years now uh, and it's traveled to different countries in bangalore islamabad kabul kathmandu colombo so we're trying to build a south asian space and then internationally i try and show up for integral european conference there are dialogues on colonialism that uh, i am a part of and trying to initiate uh, elizabeth and thomas so the we space work we are doing so some of that uh, for my livelihood i also do leadership training for other ngos which are national ngos so i do leadership work for two of the largest volunteering networks in india make a difference and bhumi so that pays the bills so i do about 20 30% of my time for that kind of paid work and about 70 80% of my time volunteering wow you are very busy <laughs> <laughs> you are young enough to move the world yeah. that's good <laughs> yeah 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 i'm so glad that people uh, now i mean i was more than 40 than when i came across the books of ken wilber so mm -hmm. uh, you know today it has all gone earlier and i'm really yeah. happy that there are young people who are taking it on really and doing Absolutely. trying to yeah. make a difference in the world that's yeah. great really great i'm grateful so what are your projects in the sense how do you see the future what where, where do you go to what is your north star i think people who are on the edges like you're on an edge because you're somebody from europe now talking to someone from india so you're really on the boundary you're on the edge and i'm on the edge and i think people on the edges are the ones who are dealing with complexity who understand nuance and i feel that a collective of people a nameless collective it doesn't even need to have a name but a tribe of people on the edges around the world if we can sense together if we can coordinate actions together if we can influence i feel there is hope there <laughs> that's the sensing organ that the earth needs to or the earth is already evolving i think the sensing organ of the planet is already evolving and uh, the example i use is just as the uh, eye has a very different configuration it's a very delicate organ compared to say the nails or the fingers i think but the eye can see something beyond itself so i feel this network this movement of people which is already there it's named also by some people that movement as it starts seeing things together will start getting a picture of what is possible i think right now the cells haven't come together like in the eye you need a concentration of cells and i think we are starting to do that and i think we will birth or what what wants to happen is in the etheric space and i feel we need to create landing pads like just as a plane an aeroplane needs a airport to land i think the future vision is so large that no one mind can hold it it needs a landing pad and as we connect as we hold these shared spaces i feel the future will land we'll be guided there is a higher intelligence at work and we need to act in surrender of that and trust it i think that's what i feel is the way none of us is intelligent or wise enough to predict the way or even plan it so i think surrendering to nature surrendering to trusting trusting our resonance trusting each other playing the game together i think that's that's where it is that's a very wonderful vision the only thing i would add what we also need to do is to how can you say to defend the boundaries because there are very powerful forces who try to to go against this movement and we need to be aware of that i don't want to say to fight against it but to find a way to 
Yes. <laughs> you know, deal with them. Yeah. To, yeah. To, to avoid avoid them or to 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 be under undercover. I don't know how to say that. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, fighting is useless because they are much yeah, more powerful. Yeah, yeah, no? yeah, so we yeah. need a way to to deal to with them. them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But be aware of the very, yeah, yeah. very forceful yes, counterpart, yes, which is yes. which is coming out now. It was all the time it was there, you know, but now it's sort of that everyone who wants to see can see it, you know, because in the I think in the past two, three hundred years it was undercover and we didn't notice it. Mm. Things happened. There are wonderful uh, documentaries about that, about the race of the oil companies for instance you know mm -hmm. and how, uh, what uh, horrible morals uh, there there was the constitution of these people i can share that also in the, mm -hmm. in the video mm -hmm. with you um so they have built up their power over many 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 years and we didn't notice it and we wouldn't still notice it if it didn't come out now you know i mm -hmm. i have the the feeling that in this period of time all these bad things are showing up so we can see them mm. and that we can how do you say wrap our minds around how mm. in future not to be fooled let's say by this them. Yeah, yeah 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 how not to be fooled by them yeah and it's not easy i mean i think it's we are asked one by one everybody is asked to do what they can do not everybody can do the same thing but to to stand up and say no we have, yeah, yeah, we want yeah. a different future, not the one yes, you have planned yes, for me. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Yes. I think uh, one inspiration I have is Gandhiji for sure, <clears throat> because we, of course, I don't know if we'll ever be able to hold that level of non-violence. But when dealing with British, Gandhi said that hate the sin, not the sinner. And he said, I'll not cooperate with evil. Non-cooperation with evil is a duty. Still, he held a space of love and sympathy for what otherwise would be seen as the oppressor. In fact, saying that, you know, before dehumanizing me, you must have had to dehumanize yourself. And I feel for your dehumanization. And I'm willing to stand not as a weak person, but as a strong person. Uh, and I think there is something there. We have to reinvent it for our times uh, on how do you do that? I think that's where it's a very powerful stance. And uh, you've seen how many people, British people could just not, not love Gandhi. Like they, they were disarmed by the deep nonviolence with which he received them, you know, and, and yet while disagreeing with them. So he held that paradox so beautifully, uh, you know, saying that we want the British to leave as friends, you know, yeah. they may treat us as enemies, but we'll be friends. I, there's something very large about that. Uh, and I don't know how it will apply, but there is something there for mm -hmm. me. Yeah, no, I think people like him, they just emanate a, a different way of being in the world. And I think we do have a chance because we now know about psychology. And I just read a book yesterday about all these people who are now so believing in the wrong things, let's say. Um, he was saying this is the narcissism, the wound, the childhood wound, which uh, there was no love for the child or not enough. And then in later life, <clears throat> they try to, to get it somehow. And then they create, or they are the bosses or they're the underdogs. These are mm, the two possibilities mm, they have mm. because they are not themselves. They have never been allowed to be themselves. Mm, you know? mm. And uh, so he calls that Nazis, uh, uh, narcissism, uh, uh, which is a psychological term in this um, case. And he is explaining the fear and the, let's say, mental illness. You can say it mental illness. Maybe it's not diagnosed as this, but of most of the people being grown in our countries who have uh, the deficit of love, the deficit of recognition, the, the um, trauma, constant trauma in childhood and later too. And so who is traumatized and hasn't worked on the trauma hmm. is uh, prone to traumatize others later. Yes, and that's what yes. is happening in our worlds. But if you understand the psychology behind, maybe you can come to the understanding at least why they are doing this. 
Yeah, yeah. And then coming oh, until loving all those <laughs> them, that's really a spiritual challenge, I would say. But yeah, yeah. At yeah. least understand. You, I'm yeah, so far yeah. that I can understand it, but mm -hmm. I don't agree log logically, you know? Mm -hmm. And so my uh, enigma is how can you reach the people despite of their traumatization and their that it's like um like a dependence <clears throat> to be in a certain way you know like a, a model i i have to follow the leader i have to follow the leader because you know this is my mama now in germany we have a mama <laughs> yeah. you know so we have to yeah, believe yeah, that yeah. she is doing everything for her and we are children we have to obey things like that this is psychologically <clears throat> well established this sort of behavior and so we can understand it but how can you get people out unless they are open to see that to see their own needs never yeah, make them to yeah, work on yeah. that and this yeah, is yeah much more work than saying all oh, the others are the the yes yes <laughs> you know? yes absolutely yeah, yeah. totally agree. Mm -hmm. so i think i for today i i've learned enough but i would be happy <clears throat> to get more information about what you're doing and maybe sure. when i get into it a little bit more we could meet again and do another conversation sure it would be lovely to do that. Yeah. And give us some final word, some inspiration from the other continent. <laughs> just lots of love, I think, uh, more than inspiration. I think just want to give out a lot of love, big hug. You're one global family and it's a, it's a privilege to be able to connect across boundaries. So just lots of love, lots of love. And there is a home in India. Whenever you want to come, please, you're most welcome. We'd be, love, we'd be very happy to host you and show you around. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe I will go even to India someday. Yes. I don't have too much time, but let's see how... how please how hold that develop. intention. Yes, please hold that intention. Okay, Lovely. see you next time. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you.